Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Graham Newell. I'm the Director of Education for Iris Connect. I'd like to start, oh no, I think a special warm welcome to colleagues from, I think it's nine countries, 70 different organisations. Uh, and we've got a fair few people coming in from Australia, uh, New Zealand, and they're going to need a lot of coffee, but we will try and keep it as lively as we can. So, partners in crime for this. TPEA, the Technology, Pedagogy and Education Association. I think it's an organisation that really deserves to sort of grow and become more important as we move away from the what of technology into the why of technology. And I hope people will sort of bear that name in mind. And also Mirandanet, which is a, a group of uh, researchers and educationalists who've done a lot of research for us, particularly around of using Iris Connect remotely for in-ear coaching. What about Iris Connect itself? Well, it started, what, 13 years ago, when Andy Newell, who's the managing director, was involved in a Gatsby-funded project, uh, looking at ITE science teachers. And since then, the technology has evolved enormously, and, but the values of the company are still the same. It's about empowering teachers and not controlling them. And the key interactions are very much the same around collaboration, resources, self-review, coaching and research. It now works in 30 countries and really part of its aim is to enable the educational ecosystem within and across various parts of the educational organisation, but also internationally. We've also evolved into working in different sectors. So during the height of this crisis, we were working very closely with GPs and Health Education England, as they themselves were adapting to having to do the new processes. But the why of this particular webinar, I wrote an article for NACE at the very start, which was called Beyond the Maelstrom. And it got repeated as these things do in different forms and in different places. And talking to sort of Professor Marilyn Leask, she suggested we ran a webinar. I thought we'd had tracked 20 people. We've had 100 signups, nine countries, 70 organizations. So Marilyn was very much right. I hope that this can be the start of a professional dialogue amongst all the people that are interested. So now let me do a little bit of housekeeping. Andy? So, use general chat. You've got an icon at the bottom which says chat. When you touch that icon, remember you have to select panellists and attendees if you want everybody to see your comments. Use that for general comments or questions that you want to go out to the floor. Use question and answers, which is another icon in the middle of the screen. And that's for private questions that you want specific answers to. We may invite you to join the panel to enable your audio if you feel you want to say something special. And we're here for a very full and frank debate about a very unusual situation. So uh, no silly questions. Um, and we've never run a large scale webinar before. So be gentle with us. This is the first time we've done it. One other thing I want to make the comment on is that we are very much in a tight time frame on this one. Um, I was incredibly over ambitious when I started putting the agenda together. So it's going to be a little bit like a teach me. So if anyone who starts to overrun, you'll get a sort of beanbag thrown at you. And if you keep talking far, far too long, we'll just hook you off the thing. So we need to be space. We need to move with sort of some energy through that. So what's the structure of the day? Well, first we've got the panelists and the panelists are there to give very short, sharp perceptions of what they think the problems are going to be. And it's to stimulate questions and comments from the, from the, from the room. Um, we will be picking those up. Andy will be out, uh, acting as a sort of uh, question master and sort of feeding those back in. Then Andy's going to put a context around educational technology generally. We've then got an international group. Um, 
And the international group includes colleagues from the Netherlands, Denmark and Ireland, who are, how they're going to use technology, how they are using educational technology in this difficult time. So we're going to pull the threads together at the very end with Andy talking about how we might have a more holistic approach to ITE, which is relevant not just to this present crisis, but to the future of ITE um, as we go forward. So as I say, I hope this starts a professional dialogue. Thank you very much. And so we're going to go straight to the panel. And I think, Vesna, the people are John Lodane, Winchester uh, University. He is actually chair of the P, uh, the firm of the TPA. Uh, Sarah Uni from De Montfort University, who's actually done research for us. Elizabeth Hitson from University of Sunderland. Um, Elizabeth has got a real interest in the use of video and also in international education. And Dr. Connor Galvin, um, who is sporting a magnificent beard, which is his lockdown beard, I believe. Um, and Connor describes himself as a digital journeyman. He runs the PhD programme at uh, University College Dublin, but most importantly, he was key to the ITE lab, Initial Teacher Education Lab project, uh, which was Erasmus Plus and looking at digital competencies needed for students in ITE. So over to you. Wonderful. So, thanks. thanks for that intro, uh, Gwen. That's wonderful. Um, is everyone happy just running uh, their, their presentations in the order that uh, is on the screen here? Yes, that's right. Fantastic. Um, John, if you'd, um, uh, I don't know, if you, do you have slides to share? Yes, I do. Well, you should be able to, yeah, feel free to share your screen and um, off we go. It says I can't share it while the other participant is sharing. Ah, oh, that's me again. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I've stopped sharing and now you can. Great. There we go. Can you all see that? Yep. Great. Well, welcome. Thank you for inviting us. Um, my name is John Ordain. I'm the chair of the Technology, Pedagogy and Education Association, and we're National Subject Association for Educational Technology. So it's really good to be um, asked to look at how ed education technology can overcome the challenges in ITT. Um, I also work at the University of Winchester for the Institute of Education. So there's a dual role here. We're a large provider. Um, we train on undergraduate degrees and we've got secondary, we've got PGCE, we've got school centre training. So a lot of the issues that we're starting to think about, what are the challenges that we have um, in this COVID-19 crisis and post-COVID-19? So it's this dual nature of, a, of of two roles um, that we're considering as we look at this presentation. So I'm really pleased to also be presenting with Dr. Sarah Uni, who's Professor of Educational Innovation. I'm now gonna hand over to her. Welcome everyone, it's great to see you. So we've been looking at the challenges from an ITE provider's ex perspective. And obviously we know that what's happened is that as schools locked down, it also meant that our trainees suddenly were also not in their placement schools and suddenly they're at home. They're halfway through their PGCE. How do they continue their training? So this has been quite a time of anxiety because it's new for us at the university, it's new for our trainees as well. So the first thing we need to think about is how do we support students preparing and finishing their training? We also need to think about what stages are our students in, because it might not just be PGC programs you deliver on. If you have the undergraduate degree, at what stage are they? If they just started, are they in their final year? We do need to think about access to technology. What access to technology is there in the university? For me, my campus is completely shut down. There is no access. So instead, we've been giving out laptops. What's the access to technology in schools? What are the remote platforms that people are using? What training is needed? How do we maintain partnerships? And how do we move, adapt, and innovate in this field? So these are some of the challenges, and we're just putting those on the table to help spark the discussion today. So I've been um, struck by, um, firstly down in the bottom left, this quote from L.R. Nost. Um, I'm a primary school teacher by trade, so um, I'm kind of thinking in that way. And, and for me, um, 
this replicates what we're doing, trying to do at ITE. So when little people are overwhelmed by big emotions, um, it's our job to share our calm and not join their chaos. And uh, it's been a very unusual situation for ITE for us. And the challenge is, as we lock down, um, what does learning look like and how do I continue with learning? And so um, this dual nature for our students who are training um, and, and doing their, their degree is how do I continue with my degree and what will that look like, my own learning? But when I'm in school, how does that look like and how am I the teacher? Um, and hindsight is a wonderful thing. I, I've got that phrase that's, that keeps coming through my mind at the moment. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, but we actually do have hindsight as we know that we might have a, a second phase as we, as we develop. So part of what we, we're trying to do with students, the challenge, is to think about, okay, in your first phase, there were many models actually to just developing um, content and just getting the, the system of learning and education running. So in your first, I put in the title here, it's okay uh, through phase one, the types of teaching styles you had, whether it was just digitizing resources, but actually as we move into phase two and we, and, we, and we reflect, actually there are pedagogical models that we want to train students to understand and develop learning more. So I highlight Julie Salmon's work in the middle, who talks a lot about online teaching and delivery, some fantastic work, but builds on the pedagogy of developing the environment but there are technical aspects, but also um, how you create the content as well and how you um, get greater amounts of interactivity. I also point to Linda Matthews's work when she, when it's, she says it's about decisions that we make. The types of learning that we want students to do is about you are a really good teacher at the heart of it, okay, as you develop. But you have to make choices about whether it's face-to-face -face learning that you're going to develop, whether it's online learning, whether it's blended learning and what does that look like? Do I understand all of those three different spheres and the interaction between all three? Okay, so what the pandemic has shown us is that it's no good to have a pedagogy that relies only on a face-to-face -face instructional model. If the embracing of digital technologies allows us to do different kinds of ways of learning, and we've already been engaging with that on our initial teacher education training, then we're in a position to move on to online learning much more smoothly. So in this slide here, you can see that we're looking at how we can implement online learning. When would that take place and which pedagogic models will I be able to develop? So on the left, you'll see a box. It's actually taken from a school in America that moved to a blended approach with days at home with um, synchronous online learning and then days back in school with face to face teaching. That's also what we've experienced in England during uh, the, this time as well. So the questions to ask here then are around models of asynchronous and synchronous learning. What are the pros and cons of both? And what is the when, the why, and the how of e-learning? And we put those up just to stimulate the debate again. So back to John. Thanks, Sarah. So I'm gonna share um, just some um, points for us as a um, university, as a provider, because we started this week to look at, well, what does September look for, for us as our students start to return in a different method? We had to move quite quickly to an online provision. We were in the middle of a face-to-face -face teaching when we were locked down. And so we're starting to think, well, what do we do differently? What does it need to look like? So on the slide here, we've, we've picked up some key expectations and elements of what we think good practice for us as an Institute of Education, what it looks like. And the first one I think is really important normally for us the opportunities when we meet a new group is to do that ice breaking or and that meet and greet but actually when we're doing online developing new communities of, of learners online um, then we have to do more to actually reach out and build that sense of community it's very easy to get overwhelmed um, so it's about ensuring there's a balance between the types of learning that we are allocating and there's a purpose behind how we structure um, the learning. So it's about being clear of that expectations, thinking about the structure, but also um, developing that independence and saying to students actually in terms of what you can do, um, 
we want you to be independent in your learning. We're here to guide you. We're here to, uh, wherever you are, whether it's on campus, whether it's online or a mixture of the two, but we want to entail, we want to make sure that it's continuous provision and how you become independent is a key part of that. But also in the bottom right, we also have the different types of communication that we want to develop because actually when they come to us in September, there is a clear focus um, and challenge that it's about an academic degree and how I become that teacher. But there's also a part where we where that's about content, but we have to develop and nurture um, social support as well as um, academic support. So I'm just going to pass over to Sarah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so what we would like to highlight then is how we're going to address the challenges for initial teacher education, both during and after COVID-19. We already know from today's headlines that year groups will go back into bubbles. It's going to be very different for schools. Movement through the schools won't be the same. If, for example, year 11 are put in the maths block, they have to have their whole curriculum delivered there without access to the science block because that might contain year nine so there is going to be some real challenges for our trainees so at the heart of what we're saying is that every teacher should have digital pedagogic practice and should have the ability to use technologies creatively so on this slide we're looking at how can we equip students to have effective digital pedagogies how can they come to understand the relevance? Well, it's really sad that it's taken a pandemic to realise the relevance, but we want everyone to engage with appropriate frameworks for auditing their own skill set and to be able to progress in that skill set. Let's look at the role of mentors. Let's look at the role of a professional association like Technology Pedagogy Education can offer, like Miranda Net can offer, with a wealth of research and mentors at hand to help people. We are very keen to support the teaching of di uh, using digital technology to enhance pupil learning across every subject. And at the same time, it's all of our responsibilities as well to carry on promoting online safety, both for ourselves, for our trainees, and for our students and our learners and our pupils as well. And I'll hand on to John. And so as um, one of the things that we're going to do as an IT provider is look, how do we train our teachers across these three different areas for us? Um, and so as we look at how do we deliver content and how do we model this for um, students, we're asking ourselves and we're still saying, let's keep what good learning looks like. Let's, this whole philosophy was behind, isn't it? The design of what's the design of your learning going to be like? Why are you making those kind of decisions? Um, what content will you be bringing in? It's the whole philosophy behind interactive whiteboards and uh, virtual learning environments that supports this. So we have three clear strands that we want to develop with our students. We want them to consider the design, but we also then want them to think about the delivery. What technologies are you going to use? What tools do you know that you can use? What do you feel confident in using? And um, what will suit the task that you're trying to do? And so the third aspect is also about how do we encourage our trainees to communicate well with us, but when they're in schools, how do they communicate with their teacher tutor or perhaps their um, or parents as well. So it's about keeping talking as things change for us and during times of remote distance for us, um, it's about connecting communities. So even if you're in your home, you feel part of, of a classroom, a wider classroom, but you're still part of something for us. That's the challenge. And so when we moved to a um, online experience in the middle of lockdown, we had several modules that we were encouraging students to um, sign up for and to take. And actually, we, we got some, some um, we, we got some feedback from them. And we asked them, right, during this experience from the face to face, from moving very quickly into an online blended learning provision, what did you like? What were your thoughts? And they shared these thoughts with us. They liked actually the fact that we could share with our, um, our students that we're all learning this, we're all in the same boat. Um, the perception sometimes that we have to know it all being in um, ITE, but actually that perception that we are learning together created a, a good balance. Um, but also the ability to be able to work in small groups was really important for students. 
but as tutors we also had to be mindful that actually if students are at home uh, in an online environment not everyone will have the resource so all the software at home so it's thinking very carefully as a as a tutor how do i design that learning so that all my students can access the learning okay last two slides now we're coming to an end so our goal is to generate reflective practitioners so here is a grid to help us with our reflections so let's think about what were the new ways of learning during the COVID-19 crisis what have I explored what's my reflections on that is there anything that I want to keep and if so why do I want to keep it what are the threats to this way of working we've already talked about the digital divide and how this is a major challenge and also what actions do I need to take for example whether or not it's about developing your own digital literacy skill set competency frameworks you can be looking at. Um, we can also put in the chat and into the Google Doc the uh, books that we write in, in this area as well to support trainee teachers. And I'm going to hand back to John. So thank you for listening. Thank you. And to finish with, um, we just leave these points with you that Sarah has just highlighted. Um, we want to be able to look, look at the relevance of digital technologies for our trainees, but we've also got to be able to um audit and develop their needs and identify what they need um, so we thank you very much for listening to our presentation and i'll hand back to andy thanks that's fantastic and really very interesting i think um one of the things that um, feels quite clear is that there's a conversation to be had about whether there are significant differentials between uh digital pedagogies and and in classroom pedagogies and the extent to which ITE providers are now beholden uh, to, to, uh, to to really uh, double down on the uh, the digital side of things. I've got a couple of questions from the floor um, if, if you bear with me. Um, so uh, let me find the, the relevant one. Um, Query, this is from uh, Nolene Wright. Um, if, if content is released a week at a time, how does that cater for those who A, prefer the big picture, uh, B, like to plan ahead, C, work fast? Um, I don't know precisely which part of your, your presentation that related to, so forgive me. So it was, um, yes, it was the strategies that we think for um, September. It's a great question. I mean, one of the things that came back from the feedback as we moved modules online was actually in times of, um, crisis actually um, you can be overwhelmed too much and, and our students were going don't give me everything at once just tell me what I need to do for this session because I've got uh, I've got English or I've got um, other subjects that have competing um, kind of demands on me so one of the things that we did for that bigger picture is we put at the top of our modules a general summary a general kind of this is the bigger picture this is where it's going but actually we managed their time by actually just releasing a um, a week at a time and and giving them a highlight saying for next week uh, this is the content for this week but for next week to get you ahead please read this I hope that answers uh, a question. Kelly asks would you um, be able to um, well what she's asking whether it's possible to put the slide back on the asynchronous synchronous uh, learning uh, for a second one thing I would say to Kelly is we um, we will if this is okay with all the panelists collate uh, the presentations and make them uh, available later as well so it's you know this isn't just a one-shot uh, deal but um, uh, if that's easy to access then then that might be um, appreciated Can we just go there? slide four John thank you oh, sorry. No, slide four there we go no that's it yeah I think one of this is one of the, the really interesting uh, questions at the moment is uh, I think that lots of education professionals are really str struggling with this around um, you know the blend of synchronous versus asynchronous uh, learning and um, you know obviously each one has um, its own challenges but it's also its own potential um, you know I'm aware of schools who've um, moved to a purely synchronous uh, model and it's creating uh, huge challenges in terms yeah. of timetabling and stress and all of that and also you know not really leveraging the capabilities of uh, digital platforms for asynchronous learning uh, but in, and on the other end of the spectrum of course we've got schools who who aren't engaging with synchronous at all either for policy reasons or for issues of um, digital access so um, I think that's probably one of the biggest issues facing the education system right now is how to create that that appropriate blend 
between the two. There was actually a question in the in the chat about um, what platforms you may be using for these two um, these two different interactions. Um, is that is it um, something that you use with your trainees specifically um, uh, in terms of a, a VLE or a or a conferencing tool? Um, it, it, if it, we'll take it in turns. Um, obviously, from the university perspective, there'll only be certain platforms for which they will a have a license and b uh, give um, IT support for. So we, for example, um, what we're using now, Zoom, is great and it's brilliant for live streaming. But um, there are institutions that w will not do that for live streaming um, because they and they don't offer support for it so for us we're looking at blackboard collaborate ultra and you can see it's called bbcu in the corner there and that that seems to offer breakout rooms chat facilities and help with synchronous learning at the end of the day uh, john and i were discussing this and, and and we know from practice that really it's about a hybrid isn't it it's not one size fits all and we just need to be working with different platforms and a blend of asynchronous and synchronous over to you john so what i would say for us is the same uh, we use canvas um, within our institutes and microsoft teams but within our training for our trainees one of the things that we um, are doing are just reminders and refreshers of some of the, the tools that we have shown to um, trainees. So apps like Explain Everything that help you to create that blank canvas, but also record your PowerPoints, narrate to it, or move content around. The same with um, things um, like slide decks or different kind of tools that they could use, book creator. Um, so we're reminding them of some of the tools that help that help to set up learning and move what they were doing in the classroom um, into a more synchronous environment. Mm. I think one of the um, challenges we faced in order to provide uh, CPD uh, to, to, to the schools that we work with has been the fact that because there's this, such a diversity in terms of platforms, it's extremely difficult to actually provide concrete advice. And so where we've moved to, and I think is a, a smart move, is, to, is this idea that let's really double down on the underlying pedagogies so that people know how to express them through whatever channel is available um, and, and, and support people to understand how the channel can affect the nature of communication and the nature of the learning experience so um, that's just a, 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 a that's just a perennial challenge I think we're all facing when it comes to supporting teachers is to actually recognize there's such diversity that um, that you know we can't go with a one-size-fits-all um, set of recommendations I'm sort of mindful that uh, time is pushing on so um, if, if uh, everyone's uh, comfortable I, I would quite like to to, to move on to um, um, uh, Elizabeth uh, Hidson from the University of Sunderland. Is that uh, okay if we do that? And I'm, I think we'll still have just a little bit of more time at the end to, to pull any over, uh, overarching questions together. Thank you. Uh, mindful of Graham's uh, five minute warning, I haven't prepared a set of slides, so I'm just going to talk to you. But I'm uh, very happy to pick up these conversations in the chat and in the Google document afterwards. So anything that I say that, that might have any interest to somebody, I'm fully prepared to share that. So just a quick introduction. I'm Elizabeth Hidson. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Sunderland, and I work in the international and independent distance learning team. So a lot of the work that we do is internationally. We run a, a PGC to British uh, teacher standards uh, in just about every country where there is an international school. But another side of the work that I do is also in providing the academic uh, modules to some SCIT providers in the northeast of England. So um, we work with them quite closely to make sure that the, the trainees have the research informed practice that uh, we all expect of, of trainees entering the profession these days. Beyond that, I'm also a governor of a local primary school and of course I'm a parent. So all of these perspectives kind of are, are kind of whirling around as I think about what to say and what to talk about, trying to keep all the different perspectives. As Graham mentioned, I have a, a career long interest in video right back to the early days of being an ICT teacher and trying to get uh, digital video into the curriculum. My master's supervisor was uh, professor, now Professor Andrew Byrne, who wrote the original Vector DV report, digital video report. So I've been playing around with video my entire career. And so that has kind of shaped the way that I see the communication aspect of the work that we do um, beyond sort of um, other types of platforms. I have a real belief in the power of, uh, of video. 
for reflective and dialogic practice, which has become more sophisticated or understand it better now years in as to what that can do and how it can be used. And of course, there are many issues. But one of the interesting things about COVID lately is that what seemed to be taking quite a long time to become established has somehow miraculously uh, become something that we now have at our fingertips. Everybody has moved so quickly to try to respond to the global situation that they have uh, sort of prioritized the use of communication technologies. It's everywhere. It, you know, it might be inconsistent. Some might be using Zoom, some might be using Teams and, and many other platforms, but it's there and people are more comfortable. And some of the initial problems with video that I would have encountered people being self-confident or you know, checking out their hair and things like that, we've become kind of numb to that now, which only I think bodes well for um, video in reflective practice. So in my PGC work, um, when I work with uh, international schools all over the country, all over the world, sorry, um, one of the issues has been that there is no consistent educational technology base. And beyond that, that I also don't work within an in a environment where there is a consistent national standard. We respond and react and, and sort of think ahead to how we can work with um, people who are very well equipped, perhaps in the international schools in Hong Kong, and how we can work with small schools in Malawi, for example, where they don't have those sorts of technologies. And uh, it, it will come as no surprise that uh, I am also a, a member of the Technology Pedagogy Education Association and of Miranda Net. So an awful lot of, of my perspective and the way that I work and, and the, the issues that I raise will have echoes in what John and Sarah have, um, have been talking about because we are a group of like-minded people who believe in pedagogy before technology, despite being the Technology Pedagogy and Education Association. So. I think that's useful to bear in mind, to take heart that um, we all believe in the power of learning and what technology can do for us as expert teachers, expert learners, the people who share our practice and who promote the next generation of learners, teachers and, and educators that we all work with. So um, we have had some very interesting experiences, a lot further back perhaps than some of our national colleagues in my role because schools in China and Hong Kong were starting to shut very very early and so we were dealing with trainees as far back as January whose schools were beginning to close whose teaching was beginning to go online and, and you know, being a, a teacher education program we had to respond to well what do we do with these trainees who are now not allowed to go into the classroom and of course as that has varied nationally that has varied internationally we have had some really well-equipped schools who've just almost flipped the switch and turned everything online um, to some schools where none of that has happened. And the challenge of, of being a responsive uh, educational provider is trying to work out what we know about our students. And of course, that's going to be the same for all of us. We know about our students, we know about their contacts, contexts, and we can work with them. Uh, another issue that we've noticed with um, our placement trainees is that placements in many places have stalled where there are trainees who are part way through a program those trainees have tried to get um, that carried over into the next academic year and so we now have a situation where placements are becoming even more precious than they were before and that's causing us uh, complexity because not that we wouldn't wish to find other ways of prioritizing the way that they might be teaching online for example but that we have to we have to do so in line with international educational um, bureau and the way that they um, uh, register and um, accredit their own teaching staff so we haven't been able to accredit online teaching which i suppose is good in a way because we have not trained them to be online teacher educators. And as much as a good teacher will make a good online educator, given you know, a number of um, things like good technology, good training, these teachers tend to be at an early stage of their career and perhaps not as confident or competent to be able to make that kind of switch. So remembering that everybody is in the same boat, I think is, is absolutely vital. But we are having to think about that in case it comes online. Uh, we work very closely with the Hong Kong educational uh, EDB 
And if Hong Kong were to say, yes, we will accredit online teaching as part of initial teacher education, we would be ready to switch on the capacity to be able to do that. I think that's one of the areas where I am really excited about the power of video, video enhanced um, observation, dialogue, reflection, all of those really powerful technologies and approaches that can be enabled even better in the online forum. But we have to wait and see and we have to sort of bide our time on that one. Um, Travel is another issue, and for us that was not just an international travel issue. I can't go to Macau, I can't go to Cairo, I can't go to Hong Kong, but I also work with providers in the northeast of England. I can't go half an hour down the road to work with one of our skits, um, at least potentially until January. So regardless of whether those trainees are down the road or a thousand miles away, we're all having to find new ways to keep in communication. And that's, I suppose, the, the benefits of the, the platforms and the, the different kinds of technologies that we're able to use to keep in touch. That, you know, looking at some of the, the, the lovely work that John and Sarah have put together, there are, there are many approaches that you can take and it's all going to have to be contextualized into what you have available and the time that you've got within your own courses. So um, what we are doing is we are looking at the use of video. We are using just because people are interested, we are also using Canvas as our VLE. Um, we have Panopto um, for video capture built into that. We have Microsoft Teams as our sort of communication platform. Um, we don't have a whole lot else of anything special. So it's a case of you know, making this technology do what we need it to do. We have always been in the situation of asking for video of some kind. So as long as a piece of video can be captured somehow and uploaded to a safe and secure portal, then we're prepared to work with that. Um, the challenges for observation, uh, quality assurance, working with our, not just our trainees, but their in-school mentors. Um, we also have in-country professional practice tutors who may be involved in the um, uh, the, the observation, the teaching, and the mentoring. And we have to think about those issues both individually, uh, working with you know, my my tutor group who are currently in Hong Kong. How, how can I improve that on a one-to-one -one small group and also on an on a at-scale basis? Uh, with my skit work, I've also been in discussions as to how that's going to look from our skit partners moving forward a longer, thinner induction while they wait to see how schools are going to react to the reopening. Um, uh, the continued provision of alternative forms of assessment. One of the things that we quite successfully moved forwards was a piece of action research um, that they would have done on their own teaching in the school. We're now, we have now been in the position to say, okay, if, if you know that this, this type of teaching is something that you would want to try out in your classroom, let's plan for that. We'll plan it as a hypothetical assignment. What kind of online research methods might you use to gather information? Um, what, what, what's out there in the field? What resources can I direct you to? So that it becomes a much richer piece of work, uh, perhaps from the academic perspective, as it maybe would have been compared to when they were in their classroom worrying about okay, I have 20, 30 children sitting in front of me. How do I make this work in that context? So you know, looking very carefully at assessment and what we count as being valid assessment for teacher training and looking really at the learning objectives that, that we provide. What, what are we saying we need you to know about? And, and can we preempt that, do some sort of assignments that are, are ready for them to be able to do now with all of the problems, but that then become a useful platform for the future? So solutions for us, uh, and uh, I'm sure this will echo with many of you, standardizing all of the materials that we provide into a fully accessible online platform. As international independent distance learners, uh, learning providers, we already did that, but we are now looking at our materials and saying, okay, these must be absolutely on point now. It must have good quality video, it must be well structured. It must be available synchronously and asynchronously. We do a certain amount of time release but perhaps in blocks rather than week by week, because we do have people who are in multiple different time zones who may need to work at 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. or on a Monday or a Sunday rather than the Monday because that's when their working week starts. So looking at that much, much more carefully to make sure that that works. And that's as true of my skit partners as it is of my international partners. 
I need people down the road in Leeds to be able to access those materials and have a, a really useful learning experience and access to people to talk to as well as um, those who are working internationally. Uh, better use of what we have, really squeeze every penny's worth out of the technology so that it does all the things that we wanted to do. This is a time of, of, of not really looking for the magic bullets. We have what we have. We can maybe plan for the future as how that might be better, but recognizing that you know, we, we usually barely scratch the surface of the technologies and the software and the platforms that we have. We can do better with what we've got, but we just maybe need to ask um, more specific questions about how that technology can work for our pedagogy and what we need to adapt to respond to that. I would also say that looking at um, looking at those assessments in terms of portfolios, rich portfolios of evidence that show a wide variety of their practice. We were able to, although we couldn't accredit online teaching, we were able to look at some of the work that our trainees were doing with online teaching in places like Hong Kong or further afield and allow them to upload videos of some of their online teaching to show how they were planning, how they were adapting, how they were questioning so that some of those teacher standards were being met with the use of video snippets that were showing the development of their pedagogy. So really rather you know, flexible and, and open to what they have in front of them, what they can do rather than what they can't do, I think. So keeping video moving forward, keeping all of our technologies up to date, making sure that our staff are trained, making sure that we now move to having students think more carefully about online teaching because it may well be the way for the future. Um, a lot of schools now are interested in how do we make up for those students who have experienced either A, the digital divide, so they didn't have the technology to be able to keep up with their peers, or perhaps who have lost out because of the way that um, online teaching and learning has gone. And so one of the things that I'm doing is turning that into an opportunity for our trainees. Let's have a look at what schools are doing. Our very first module on our PGC, our first master's level module, looks at um, the nature of intervention. Let's look to see what your school, your region, your country, and internationally we are doing in response to COVID-19 and using that so that we have the richest knowledge about what people are doing in individual classrooms, uh, schools, countries, uh, sort of national groupings, um, international groupings, and all over the world. So I think I'll end it there because I think that was definitely more than five minutes. But I'm very interested to hear what other people are doing, very interested to respond to any questions that come up in the chat. And um, I will leave it for now and hand back to the, to the centre to tell me where we go next. Thank you. Well, that was uh, that was fantastic actually thank you so much for those various contributions and there's so much there that um i think you know it's going to take a little while to sort of unpick uh, unpick it all I, I, the the implications of, of of what's happened with regards to the covid obviously affects so many different ways that we're operating right now i um there's not, there was a basic point that has come out uh, in a couple of the presentations that I uh, think is worthy of really digging into a little bit. You mentioned placements. I think the, the previous uh, presentation mentioned the challenging uh, situation around placements. Um, can we be explicit about why those challenges are occurring? From our perspective, um, the, inter the international PGC, they find their own placements and then they make an agreement with the school. But if we can't pass them in their two placements, they therefore are not qualified teachers. And so they have to sit on that placement and basically nobody else can have that placement. And that, that's one of the key issues that there are only so many. And I think with a, a bumper crop of, of potential teacher registrations coming nationally and internationally, that's going to be a big issue. I think it was already an issue this year in certain places around the UK where there simply weren't very many placements going. Well, I know, um, so, I'm aware of, for example, yeah. Teach First having to, um, uh, it was 150 uh, trainees that they couldn't place, even though they're already on the programme. And Is this a matter of just the, the volume? Because I can't imagine that they they experienced a volume issue because they must have been aware. It must be more about the schools who were going to be able to accept placements now saying, no, we can't. Um, does that is that related specifically to the challenges of, of, of COVID-19 providing the appropriate support to teachers 
uh, in the schools are they looking at it and going this is just too much we can't have uh, trainees i think there may well be an issue on on the capacity of a school to handle um, trainees let's not forget that with every trainee comes the expectation that their lessons are observed that they have mentoring they have uh, lower timetables and everybody around them has to support them to to develop and to grow so it does you know we do expect an awful lot of schools and mentors and of of our in-school um, teacher educators for all of the work that they do and, and the other thing that we are noticing is that schools are saying oh look with everything that we have experienced this year we really want our qualified teachers to be in front of our children um, to, to make up that gap. So I also, also wonder if a school's worried about external visitors as well was the only other thing that I just occurred to me that you know if you've got um, a, a tutor or a, someone who might be tabled to visit four or five schools today or three or four schools today do they are schools sort of rejecting that as being a potential contagion risk and a, a risk to their bubbles? Yep, certainly locally. As I say, I'm a governor for a local school and all of our governor's meetings have gone online and we have no access to the school for the last four months. So, you know, that, that's a very difficult situation, being able to carry out your governance role, let alone the quality assurance needed to be able to qualify people as teachers moving out into the profession. But that, I mean, personally, uh, I think that's where video enhanced observation has a real, real sort of, you know, uh, place for the future that we can see what's going on in classrooms we can then bring the trainee together so that we have that kind of um, video artifact to look at between the mentor and the trainee to say what was going on there why were you doing and there's my dog on cue why were you doing it like that and I have seen the most amazing examples of practice where a an expert teacher sits with a novice teacher looks at the practice and grows what's happening in that kind of relationship and i think that re there is so much potential for that going forward i'm hugely yeah. excited by that myself yeah well, i mean from our point of view i think is this there's, there's value to being able to to use video in that way anyway and then uh, potentially it might allow us to 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 to, to access the learning at a time when we maybe can't so there's a sort of dual edge to that i'm really mindful of time so i'm just going to push on and and uh, um hopefully again we can sort of summarize a little bit at the end um connor are you, are you able to uh, provide us a, a, a bit from uh, your perspective absolutely and, and and thank you very much for for the invitation to do so um i won't speak for very long i'll just add a couple of points um in a sense to uh, what's been said by um elizabeth and john and sarah initially the context of teacher education in Ireland is very similar to that in the UK, but it's also very different. So, for example, in my institution, we have 200 plus uh, teachers in uh, training, if you like, or in placements um, across two years. Um, so it's 200 plus 200. That's a lot of teachers in schools. And we were uh, quite startled by the, the um, prospect of that drying up completely. And that was the first sort of problem that we faced with. Now, um, as it happened, our teaching council stepped in and threw us a life raft in relation to that. And the first thing that they actually observed was that placements that are ongoing can be considered completed if they are up to about 70%. So in a sense, anyone who was doing their year one or year two placement had already covered that space and time because we operate a 50 to 60% um, placement model uh, in, in relation to how we work. Our initial teacher education is university led partnership. Effectively, that means 60, 70% of the time in schools, 40% in the university. And because of the way the terms had fallen, most of the placements meant that students were already in schools and had completed almost all of, uh, thank you for the comment uh, on the tie, had completed almost all of their um, placement hours. So effectively, the teaching council stepped in and said, this is acceptable. And that took a huge amount of pressure off us because we didn't have to think in terms of, of um, like um, um, you know, our last speaker was saying, holding placements over to next year and so on, it wasn't an issue for us. We were able to sort of say, okay, let's just concentrate on supporting them in their schools, um, although they're now working remotely. Let's just concentrate on preparing as best we can for what's coming down the line. And that gave us a certain amount of breathing space. We were not 
I'll be, I'm being very careful with my words here. We're not famous for our use of technologies in relation to, and, and my Irish Connect colleagues will know exactly where I'm coming from on that. Um, the use of technologies in teaching and learning is taken as a given in so many ways in the Irish system. And we have quite a lot of technologies in schools, but there's not a whole lot of systematic work being done in many of the universities that support that. And part of what we have been doing in the last couple of years is working on that particular space, including the use of videos and, and, and so on. But we hadn't really come far enough to be ready to be able to, um, if you like, withstand fully the shock of what happened when we went into meltdown. So on the Thursday, we were in schools. On the Fridays, we weren't. And that was it. The same applied to us in, in, in the university um, departments. Thursday we're in universities, Friday we're not, the campuses are locked. Um, it, was, it was quite um, a, a reach for the lifeboats moment. Now we had a number of things that actually stood to us as a school of education. Uh, the first is we have a strong and ongoing relationship with Microsoft here in Ireland. Um, and that proved useful for a number of reasons. It gave us a um, starting point in relation to working with, with technologies. Uh, for our student teachers in ways that we hadn't done previously. Our campus, on the other hand, has a strong relationship with Google. So, and I'll, I'll, I won't say much about that for the moment, but it proved interesting to have more than one way of reaching out to our student groups. The second sort of strength that we had when we were hit by the, um, the Corvid arrangement was that a number of our modules at the master's level, so we, we teach a because we're a graduate school, we teach all graduates. We, we don't have an undergraduate component at all, but we have the standard PME, which is our initial teacher education two-year program. We then have a number of master's programs. We then have a number of um, doctoral programs. So it's, it's, it's all at the graduate level. And scattered across the other programs that we run were various modules that were available in uh, flexible, blended, and online versions. So you can probably imagine what immediately happened. The colleagues who were running those were suddenly put at the center of everything that was going on in the, uh, in the school. So instead of just being involved in the masters in special education needs, you're now involved in helping other colleagues deal with the PME, our initial teacher education program. And it was invigorating to be perfectly honest. It was wonderful. It was also hugely challenging. Because we have one educational, well, no, we have 0.52 of an educational technologist that's available to our school. He is a local hero beyond words at this stage. And the work that he's done in helping us all make that transition from face-to-face -to, -face to at distance is, is phenomenal. Um, we also have a staff that are, are highly present and highly flexible. And that helped. So we're all teacher educators or teachers in one shape or form, even if we haven't been working on initial teacher education for a number of years. So it was like sliding back into um, uh, older patterns, but doing so from the, the, the comfort, if you like, of your home, uh, teaching from your, your, your back room, your sitting room, wherever it happened to be that you had the best uh, technology. And that allowed us to respond to the challenges of keeping the PMEs present. And the whole emphasis moved, in a sense, from curriculum to actually presence. It was very often about meeting small groups, finding out how they were going on, making some suggestions about how they can actually continue to work in their own schools. Because the schools likewise stepped in and almost adopted all of our PME students. So they became much, much more complete members of staff than they could have perhaps been previously. And they became involved in all the activities at the level of the schools. They were pulled into the responses by the, level, by the various schools and became effectively tutors, assistants, teachers within the school response, the school level response. All we had to do was keep that moving, push them in certain directions that make them more conscious of the pedagogy uh, and encourage them to you know, not, not lose heart. And that was profoundly important, I think. Now, the second advantage that we have, and I'll only speak for maybe a, a very brief moment or two on this, and then I'll, I'll close out. The second advantage is that the School of Education within University College Dublin is a part of a larger college, which is a part of a larger university. Uh, we have 45,000 students, more or less, kicking around our, our side of Dublin. 
Um, so there was a lot of work being done by the teaching and learning people in the university generally and in the college that we could borrow from and indeed feed into because it very quickly became apparent that we had a lot of expertise that other schools didn't and that other parts of colleges didn't. So it became a two-way traffic. We were helping people in archeology. span We were helping people in history. We were helping people in um, medicine and, and, and so on. And they were helping us in terms of what they had to bring to the table in relation to teaching at distance and teaching online. So the biggest challenge we all faced was assessment. And we made what I think was a very sensible suggestion um, within our college. And basically our entire college, which is all of social sciences and law, moved to online assessments that were continuous rather than terminal. We dropped all the examinations, we dropped all the standards based work and everything else, and we went straight for continual based assessments, small uh, assignments built into portfolios. And it was interesting to hear the same comment being made by the previous speaker. Um, uh, Elizabeth obviously saw the, the advantages of portfolios as well. That was a, 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 a good decision and a very helpful one from our perspective to move into that area. Now, in relation to synchronous and asynchronous, we went essentially asynchronous from the get-go. Um, and we, we added synchronous moments through tutorial groups um, when the opportunity became available over the three to four weeks after the crisis started to hit. So we built a, a backbone using our VLE, and we use Brightspace. Interestingly, we also use um, Ultimate, uh, Ultimate Collaborate as part of that um, space. We use Google Classrooms because it's an institutional level um, platform. We use a whole raft of small fly-like um, apps, Padlet, Wavelet, Flipgrid, uh, Book Creator, all of which have been mentioned already probably, and Mural and, and, and the like. So all of those were quickly slotted into service as part of what we were doing to help our students, our student teachers, uh, operate and survive in the, the, the new environment. Now, the final question that we're asked to address in this particular part of the panel is in relation to what's going to happen next and what would be the challenges. I think there's two major challenges. The first is the expectation that it would all go back to the way it was. That's a huge challenge. We have to address that. And we have to realize that, you know, it, it, it's, it's not going to be like that. The second challenge, and this I suppose is over to my colleagues in the technical industry particularly, is that nothing will ever go back to the way it was. Um, you know, we've made the jump. We're now gone to a digital world. We're now, we're not folks. We're not. This is all very temporary in my books. And I'm hearing the same message across my own university and other universities. I don't want to see a full return to, if, even if it were possible, to the way things were. I think we have come a huge distance in terms of sensible and meaningful uses of technologies in the last while. And I'd like to see that journey continuing. And perhaps that's what I'll talk about um, later in the session when. Um, when it comes to that part of the panel. But for now, th those would be my, my starting observations. And uh, as I say, very similar in many ways to what's going on in the UK, but very different because of cultural reasons and because of the position our government has taken, um, pushing everything to the schools and the schools responding wonderfully as, as in your own situation and circumstances. But then the teaching council stepping in and if you like, um, calming the waters to allow us to continue working uh, rather than start to panic about people not finishing placements. I think that was a, 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 a very important and pivotal moment. So that's my opening contribution, uh, colleagues. Well, thank you so much, Colin. That was, um, um, let me just start my video so you can see me, you poor people. Um, yes, thank you so much. That was a fascinating con um, um, contribution. I was particularly struck by the, um, the fact that you were able to um, flexibly adapt the assessment uh, to move into more of a portfolio uh, situation. Now, um, is there an element or a sense from the, the whole panel that um, in the UK, there is a little bit more inertia around being able to adapt our assessment specifically in the world of uh, initial teacher education you know if could can we move to that kind of more uh, portfolio based approach or in, in terms of or, or are we still going to be reliant on in-person lesson you know lesson observations etc in order to, to to move things forward you know is, is, is there inertia within the system as far as you can see or are we free to innovate 
just before colleagues come in, I, I would see it as being essential. And, and I think that's where there's a role for um, the sorts of technologies, the, the video technologies, the kind of things that Iris Connect can provide and uh, other providers indeed. So th there's very much a role for that distance visiting um, as opposed to the on-site, the typical on-site that we've had in the past. And we're certainly looking at it in UCD. Uh, we have the flexibility to do some, um, but again, it's, it's an ongoing conversation and it's not one that is easy to have with mm -hmm. some colleagues. If I could come in there. Mm, um, please do. When I was at the Training and Development Agency for Schools, we ran seminars on the use of video um, for observations in classrooms. And I remember coming across Iris Connect there and other various technologies. And it's really shocked me that this it's taken COVID to bring this to the fore again. It's such an obvious way, I see, of people improving their practice. Observation in a private context, shared with those who, who you um, trust, perhaps your tutors, perhaps uh, peers who you're working with to improve practice. So I'd quite like an overview of the technologies, not, not just Iris Connect, but the other ones that people are using so that those attending this webinar can go around, pick up those technologies and check if they're going to work in their setting. Thank you, Marilyn. I'm, I, I'm sort of very mindful of, of time, actually. I, um, we've, we've, um, we've had a fabulous sort of set of contributions, and I would really like us to be able to have um, more of a kind of rich conversation. My, my thought is that um, I'm mindful that we've also got the international contributors coming down the pipeline, you know, it, to, to talk about their experiences. And I don't want to eat into their time, but I was supposed to intro um, a little bit of Iris Connect, so to contextualise um, what you'd hear from them. So my idea is I'm going to do that really really quickly and we'll, we'll have the conversation with the international panel and um, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to get the panel back in at the end to talk about some of the key issues that have come out um, through the rest of the um, the rest of the session I hope that's okay with everybody because I'd really like to obviously dig in more to the the conversation that we're having here but I'm just yeah I'm having to push things on from a from a time point of view um, as I say what, I, what I'll do now is um, just um, quickly share my screen and come back so that we can provide just a little bit um, of context uh, for the, um, bear with me one second. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yep, looks fine. Okay, great. Um, just provided just a little bit of context about where we're coming from at Iris Connect, because I think there are some elements of what we're doing here that, that speak to um, some of the challenges that have already been identified. Um, and as I say, the, the following sessions won't make a great deal of sense without knowing a little bit more about where we're coming from and the things that we can do as a platform. So this is this is what we believe, you know, fundamentally we're in this to support uh, the development and uh, of, of the strongest teachers that we can. Um, and when I founded the company back in, uh, goodness me, sort of 30, getting on 13 years ago, it was pretty much driven by, by this research here, you know, looking at the cumulative effects of um, high performing uh, or lower performing teachers over time. Um, and to the point at which obviously at some point the, the, uh, you get an irreconcilable uh, difference in terms of uh, outcomes for, for for learners, and so you know we we wanted to to really look at how can we uh, best prepare and support uh, teachers in the field. And uh, another very sort of seminal piece of research, some of it doesn't all apply anymore. The language has changed, etc. Was was this work from uh, Joyce and Showers um, back in two thousand and two, looking at um, the various different learning interactions that we can experience experience um, as, a, as, as a teacher you know we can have content presented to us we can see examples of teachers use other teachers using uh, the strategies that have been outlined uh, we can uh, practice that new strategy in our classroom and uh, do so deliberately um, uh, but also we can get feedback and um, collaborate with uh, one another on an ongoing basis and I think the thing that really struck me was the fact that um, 
we only see significant numbers of teachers able to sustain change when they're exp exposed to all of these things as part of a broader blend uh, of learning activities. And um, the trouble is that the vast majority, and I speak specifically of, of CPD here, um, you know, the in-service support was, was, was very much weighted around the top end of this scale. We were presenting a lot of theory and content, but we weren't providing these rich uh, dialogic networks that connected uh, teachers uh, uh, together and, and and why well fundamentally the all of the things we see towards the bottom of this list uh, are driven or historically were driven by the process of observing teachers so teachers observing each other or being observed and receiving feedback from others um, and we were seeing within the system that this was a really expensive process which was hard to provide at scale uh, for schools um, you know you have to take one high value asset put them in a room with another high value asset and expect them to uh, then meet again and talk about it and you know the potential for covered teaching timetable considerations all of this sort of stuff and not least when we're trying to do it over a distributed program we were considering the impact even back uh, 10 years ago on the environment of driving around the country to observe um, obviously you know a lot of people find the process somewhat subjective and disruptive to the classroom um, it, space now I don't I'm not for a minute arguing that in-person observation should cease our argument is if we can uh, can free it up so that we can do more of it by uh, using uh, digital means and the other main thing that we saw again was that the vast majority of teachers that we engaged with again mostly in the in-service space um, were uh, reluctant to engage with it because of its uh, innate association with performance management and summative assessment which is where um, oh, I'm being observed today uh, comes into the equation so you know our big objective was can we use technology to enable uh, teachers to self-reflect quickly and easily to collaborate and share their practices with each other quickly and easily to allow institutions to to do the same at a, an organizational level and fundamentally the way to do that is to lower the unit cost of um, developing a shared understanding of each other's practice through observation and so that's been our objective you know to bring the process of uh, equipping a teacher with the ability to self-reflect and collaborate with others down to less than the cost of a textbook that was our that was our driving force and so at the heart of that is this notion that we might have to capture some practice and historically you know i've got a wonderful poster of a teacher's tv um on the wall behind me here which is uh, you know there's a there's a child uh, standing sitting there behind a desk and a cameraman looming over them with the caption just act naturally um you know we we did have you know it is a it is a challenge large video files quite a lot of um technology necessary to do it well so that was the first thing we sought to address and we've done that through a mobile application so it's literally just an app on one level it can be a bring your own device approach and the individual trainee could click on record and that video is encrypted and securely uploaded to their account at another level you can actually pair those devices together to create two views and four sources of audio to allow us to really dig into and analyze the relationship between um, the teaching and the learning and then where does that go? Well, that goes up into a secure platform that's under the control of the teacher, um, and they are able to control people's access to their videos. So I could, for example, click on share and now share this video digitally either with my mentor or with a tutor at university or potentially with members of my peer group and they are in a position to use this commentary space over here on the on the right to provide time linked contextual feedback which actually builds towards a real professional dialogue because I can they're threaded so I can reply uh, to, to, to people's comments we can also use something called forms to actually count uh, concrete um, collect concrete data about what we're seeing here talk time um, question types wait time uh, and any other form of rubric which we might want to, to use obviously there's an assessment component of that which I'll talk about later but actually as a self-reflective tool to help teachers to uh, effectively test their own micro hypotheses in classrooms as part of their reflective cycles that's an incredibly powerful tool too um, we can edit videos drop them down to smaller sections and just share those we can anonymize them so that that the children uh, aren't visible all of these sort of things so just I just wanted to give you a, a quick sense of how it works crucially it works 
uh, between organizations really effectively building in uh, all of the appropriate permissions to allow that to happen and we can set up collaborative spaces collaborative groups which are aligned with organization function uh, core courses particular themes or topics so that's the, the broad background that hopefully will allow us now to contextualize the um the, the conversation um uh, with, from the international contributors because most of those programs have to some degree used uh, this tool as part of it. One last thing just to say um, we've been working uh, day and night to integrate a video conferencing tool onto the platform as well so um, as of September we'll be in a position to uh, allow you to set up tutorial groups, seminar groups, one-to-one -one, uh, coaching and, and, and discussion sessions with learners, in, with, with students in the platform so that you, you, you know, um, not having to context uh, swap between uh, one platform for, for for that sort of communication and another for the the video analysis and community of practice. So without further ado, what I'm going to do uh, is hand over to my colleague uh, Vesna, who should uh, be in a position to uh, just give us an introduction to the international panel and uh, and to to, to to moderate that conversation as well. So thank you for your time. Sorry, it was a bit of a rushed. Sort of pitch but it's really important for us to understand how the uh, platform works before we move into the next the next section thank you very much andy it's been fascinating to hear the perspectives from mainly the uk and ireland but um, of course the challenges that are facing it are um, universal and especially those that are driven by the pandemic which is of course a global problem so through our work we at iris connect are in a unique position to have an insight into how these challenges are being addressed in different countries because we have presence in more than 30 countries now and this is through a combination of direct collaboration with universities and schools as well as through international projects with um, organizations such as the British Council with whom we have successfully delivered several teacher training projects around the world with the European Schoolnet, where we are partners in the future classroom lab setting and through Erasmus Plus projects, where in the last four years, we've had the opportunity to work closely with a dozen ITEs from um, as many European countries in projects focused on specifically the pedagogical use of technology for enhanced teacher training. So in this next section, um, we're going to hear from colleagues from some of those institutions who will share their experience and perspectives for the current and, and future use of educational technology to address those uh, challenges. Um, I propose that the presenters um, start and, and present one after the other, and um, we will open the floor for questions and observations after that. So it is my pleasure to introduce Connor to share his overview and the learning points from the fascinating IT lab project that uh, we had the pleasure to work with. Thanks indeed, Vesna, and uh, very happy to do so. Um, that said, it's going to be quite difficult to follow our, our last colleague. The points she made were very, very good. And I'm very interested in what was just said there about the fact that um, it's becoming easier to get permissions and clearance. I'm really pleased to hear that because, as you know, that was quite a difficulty for us in the project. So without further ado, um, I'm not going to overly labor my introduction to myself. My name is Connor. Uh, I've spoken to you earlier um, in terms of setting out some of the, the issues and reflections that we, we, we had at UCD in regard to our response to, to to the COVID crisis. But this is different because before COVID, we were heavily involved in a, uh, an Erasmus Plus project, which I'm very pleased to say involved Vesna and uh, the, the group from Iris Connect and introduced us to the whole Iris Connect platform and so on. Now, this is boring stuff. This is ITE Lab. This is what we were, this is what we tried to do. So effectively, we were a coordinated, European Commission funded Erasmus Plus project. We ran technically from 2017 to December 2019, but we leaked over into the January in the way of these things. It was a knowledge alliance and it was a knowledge alliance between higher education institutions involved in teacher education and industry partners. And as Vesna said, uh, you know, Iris Connect was the, probably the main uh, partner in that regard. We 
foregrounded and concentrated totally on digital pedagogies and skills of the future teachers. That's what we actually zoned in on from the very get go. Here is the necessary uh, uh, description, the necessary short one pager with regard to what we did. I'm not going to speak to it. I'm just gonna say it's in the slide pack for afterwards. We looked at knowledge exchange. The core of the project was about co-designing content and piloting that. And we did a, a monitoring piece of work uh, led by Roger Blamire uh, uh, on, on um, developments, case studies and so on in relation to competencies and so on. This is the rogues gallery. You can see it's an interesting mix of universities, colleges, uh, and technology partners. The three main technology partners were Microsoft, Iris Connect, and Smart Technologies. Our university partners were from Norway, from England, from Germany, from Portugal, and from Italy, and of course ourselves in, uh, in the greater Dublin area. But this is the real project. This is the real ITE lab. This is where we did our real work. It was a deep, open, professional learning conversation over three years where teacher educators met people from technology backgrounds and we argued a lot, we learned a lot. Um, the strengths of our projects can be reduced to a couple of words in many ways. It was all about co-designing and stress testing. Anything we built, we tested. Anything we tested, we tested again. We went through several iterations and this involved, and you can see Vesna in one of the pictures there, this involved working very closely with our industry partners so that all the voices were actually heard. Policy people, teacher educators, uh, industry partners, and most fundamentally in many ways, the students. The student voice was profoundly important. So we had this kind of commonwealth of voice, if you like, this variety of different voices and perspectives feeding into the project from the, the very beginning. And as we developed, it became more a shared experience. Nobody led it as such. We all helped each other find our way through. And that's, I think, what made the project so valuable in terms of the whole area where technology meets uh, pedagogy and where that in turn interacts with the, the needs, the expectations and the requirements of being a student teacher in a, on the cusp of entering a very challenging perspective. This is a typical session in many ways within um, the, the, the project. It's nice because it has Terza there from Iris Connect. It took place in Dublin in the Microsoft DreamSpace headquarters. And we were using technology um, and uh, from Iris Connect, as I say, and also some materials from Smart. The partners you see are only one of the groups. There were others in uh, Portugal and also in Norway taking part in the same session remotely. And that was in and of itself an incredible experience for all of us. Our product, if you like to call it such, and it's freely available and will continue to stay uh, freely available on our website. Um, it's basically a series of modules, IT framework modules. We had three in particular, one on teaching design, one on learning design, and one on working with learners. That's my five minutes, so I'm gonna stop it very shortly. Um, those are available to download, to take, to customize, and to use in any way that you want to. So it's a package of materials designed to university standards, built on a modular structure, but essentially loosely connected so that small snippets can be taken out and used separately and independently. And we built them together, student teachers, technology partners, and the teacher educators. That's our main resource site, itelab.eun.org. One of the um, resources there that I'd like to direct you at is the white paper, which was prepared by Vesna and her group. It's a superb reading of the challenges that um, we face in relation to better use of technology in initial teacher education. It also contains our, our end of project materials, and it also contains um, archive versions of a MOOC. This was an interesting adventure from our perspectives. We had about two and a half thousand teachers on three iterations of our MOOC. Most of them were in initial teacher education. Um, the MOOC is still available in theory, and if there's enough interest from teacher educators, it will run again this autumn. So if you're interested in following up on this particular MOOC, the topic is network teacher, teaching in the 21st century. It has a vast amount of materials associated with it that were developed in and through the project, 
and you can find the information there on the SchoolNet uh, Academy website. So what can we say in terms of uh, why did the ITE lab work and how did it work best? I think it worked best when we partnered well to support meaningful change. It's not just a case of using technology, it's using technology to change what we do and how we do it. It worked well when it became a question of understanding and leveraging the range that technology companies have to offer. Vesna and her, 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 her group offered not just the technology, they offered a whole infrastructure that allowed us to uh, build and work film club type activities. Um, we also found uh, similar approaches uh, and similar communities of teachers, if you like, available through our Microsoft partners and our smart uh, technology partners. When we were able to help shape the companies, we did so. It was very much a two-way conversation all the way through. And I think the main lessons, and I'll close with this, in terms of um, what were the takeaways, what would I say we learned from that particular period? You have to support the teacher student from where they are. You have to support them when they're learning for practice, you have to support them when they're learning from practice and in practice. And perhaps that's where the video is most useful. You have to support student teachers in building confident, open, creative, and innovative uses of technologies. And you do that best in situ, in the, the teaching and learning situation where they're worked in. You also have to invest in imagination and opportunity. You have to find ways of allowing students to lead, staff to lead, and work with uh, tech partners. Tech partners are not always trying to sell you stuff. They're also giving you fantastic ideas, wonderful access to teaching and learning communities, and um, are there to support you in, in ways way beyond just selling materials. That, I think, is one of the findings that, that struck me most in relation to uh, the, the, uh, the outcomes. So effectively, it's all there. It's, you're free to take it and to use it, to customize it to your own ends and needs. And I do heartily recommend that you take a look at those if you have some time. There's also um, developments taking place on the back of ITE Lab. Particularly, we're looking at involvement with the teacher training initiatives, uh, institutions initiative. In the UK, that's coordinated by the British Council. And I can't recommend it too highly. It's a wonderful platform to get involved with if you've not already done so. And I think I'll leave it there, Vesna. I've overstayed my five minutes by about three and a half, I think. But um, uh, it, thank you for allowing me to share very briefly the experiences we had in and through ITE Lab. Open to questions thank and thank you, you again. Thank you very much, Connor. It's not easy to condense uh, more than three years of work in five minutes, but uh, you managed very well. Um, what I propose we do now is, uh, because we've mentioned the film club um, in the uh, context of these um, last few presentations, I propose that Andy gives us an overview about what Film Club is before we have the final session where we will have the opportunity for additional questions and answers. By all means, yeah, let me just bring up the appropriate uh, screen. Um, and we will, by the way, share all the um, uh, outputs and all the material that um, came out from the IT lab, um, as well as uh, the slides, Connor, but we will certainly share the, uh, the material for anyone who would like to use it in the shared document. Brilliant. Well, uh, thank you so much for those, um, those contributions. They were you know, particularly fascinating. And, and one of them um, <clears throat> speaks to this idea of a film club. It's nothing actually new. We're talking about a sort of uh, effectively a digital community of practice informed uh, by video. And uh, there are uh, numerous research papers um, around uh, this particular theme. Um, so before we zoom in on the actual film club itself, I think it's just worth kind of reflecting on the fact that, um, you know, networks, um, digital networks in particular, have been, you know, radically uh, changing uh, the landscape, whether that be for the music you download or the uh, or stream or the, the way you might meet your future partner. One of the areas that, you know, I think has been uh, somewhat uh, lagging behind, obviously, is the, the impact of uh, professional uh, learning networks uh, in, in education. Um, because, you know, I think that what networks do is they radically alter the supply and demand curve and they give um, access to, they can connect people in, in, in really profound ways. And I think that 
you know, when we look um, specifically at education, but also even more specifically in initial teacher education, it, clear, it, it occurs to me that there are um, a range of like really crucial networks that we, 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 we need to be supporting. I mean, first of all, obviously, is, is the, the knowledge networks, the sort of delivery side of it. Um, and uh, one of the things that's most evident sometimes is this gap between the theory and the practice and one of the areas that sort of digital video and, and digital networks can really help with is actually to over to bridge that gap to to allow the the knowledge base to 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 evolve um on the basis of of real life practice um the other one of course is um skills networks you know um i think people say it's like a village to raise, raise a child um you know how can we enable that for for beginning teachers you know how can we can we reduce the the cost of the the interactions so that we can be part of a really rich network of skills um, and then finally you know um, obviously the, the process of of assessment um, you know and the, the the challenges that can be associated with that many of them can be over overcome uh, through collaborative uh, working as well and, and and at the heart of that I believe is this notion that we can start really <clears throat> developing that one level you might call it um inter-rater reliability by having a uh, reusable learning asset that we can can analyze from different perspectives but of course another way of looking at that is you know helping us as an education system to really build a shared language uh, of, of education so let's start with the first one and this is the sort of the, the knowledge network side of it and that's what i'm going to dig into here and explain just a touch more about our film club um, model. So I'm just gonna sign in to the Iris Connect platform and I'm notorious for not being able to do two things at once. So I'm going to go silent briefly and then come back to you. Okay. So um, I just wanted to introduce you to um, Film Club as a concept. Now, where, where Film Club came from was some uh, research that we undertook in conjunction with the Education Endowment Foundation. Um, we were really interested in, in two things. One, um, how can we uh, enable a community of teachers to, to work together uh, around video to bridge the gap between uh, the, the theory and the reality of their classrooms and the, and the you know their community their learner their their learners, their school um, and we felt that that was a, firstly a social endeavor um, but one that needed to be to be rich uh, and supported by um, uh, theoretical uh, input and content but also um, video models examples uh, and most importantly dialogue creating appropriate professional dialogues um, are centered around those theories and those 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 models and so, so what we we did um, was effectively build out a, a model that is effectively a flipped model that can work in person so the pre-reading um, is done uh, beforehand and then we bring teachers together in real time but what we've done now is obviously adapted that to to operate in a um, distance learning environment as well with the in-person component um, substituted into a synchronous learning environment and you can see here within the film club registration page you can go through and uh, book a ticket for the actual uh, synchronous component but in addition to that one can go away and uh, do the pre-reading as well so for example if we um, look here at the um, pre-reading around the questioning uh, theme then what we have is a series of videos exploring it was, it was the content and also videos exploring um the, the different uses that you can put questions to so you've got this notion of checking for understanding and developing procedural fluency and there's a video from tom sherrington explaining that from that point of view but also this process of engaging learners in in, in deeper dialogue to develop metacognition self-regulation etc so it's it, what we've done is a really hard job of just condensing down as uh, as as a effectively as we can uh, a, a panoply of, of, of educational research into something that we hope teachers will be able to engage with in this case um, for, for about an hour prior to um, the session itself so once we're there um, it's time for people to join uh, the film club itself and um, the film club basically is broken down into um, uh, effectively a screen a screening 
uh, and, a, and a dialogue session and then followed up by uh, quick reflection activities designed to make what they've learned and seen real in their own context. So here's the uh, screening component and, and what we'll hear here is um, a quick appraisal of the, the, the research and then what we'll do is dive into videos that are designed to provide uh, comparative um, uh, um, really dig into the differential and different uses of questioning for different purposes and then what we ask people to do as they're watching is to consider the what or what of go what's going on like just an ob objective description of what they are seeing what stands out to you about what the teacher is doing and why what stands out about what the learners are doing and why that's then in the professional conversation afterwards followed up by so what questions which are there to really uh, tease out the relationship between the theory and the practice when we think about th so what we're thinking about what are the implications of the what the things that we've seen how do they tie to the research and how do they tie back to my own experience and my own practice and then finally what we ran the session off with is uh, an exploration of the now what questions where we're taking people through that uh, question of how do we apply this how will we know when we've applied it whether it's going to be successful what adaptations are we going to need to make to the strategies we've seen in order to make them real in my own in my own classroom so that's just a, a really, really fast whistle stop tour of what we do. And of course, the last part of this is we want to join up the theory, the models, the professional conversation with a reflect, reflective or collaborative uh, activity. So within here, we then encourage people to go away and use the tools of Iris Connect to re reflect on something concrete and specific that will be of value potentially to themselves, but also to their peers. Um, and of course, at this stage within an ITE program, one could also submit videos that were then uh, made available uh, to my tutor or to my mentor uh, for more concrete, specific feedback. So that's the way that we've done this. The reason I'm sort of digging into Film Club in a bit more detail at this stage is it, it strikes me that there are really uh, two sort of major major issues facing ITE providers. One obviously is our ability to reach out and actually deliver blended digital learning experiences when we can't bring trainees together in the same place. And then the second one is that that reach out back to the school to provide the support and the feedback that those learners need. And, I, and the film club model is intended very explicitly to sit between those two things. So it allows us to absorb the content in terms of the theory, see models and examples from around the community, discuss synchronously, and then connect into an in-class contextualized uh, reflective activity. So sorry if I've bored you with uh, too much film club action, but I think it's something that is you know important for us to bear in mind. Um, I just also wanted to talk about the skills network side of it as well and um, one of the things that we're um, really proud of is the extent to which um, you start seeing the organic sharing of practice between um, between uh, participants when we're using video in a in a in a in a skills network. So this is actually a, a real time representation of um, uh, the connections between users on the Iris Connect platform at the centre. There, user uh, three two four two zero. Those are all of the sharing relationships that they have within their school. And then this was actually a connection out to their ITE tutor and the sharing relationships that they have with other members of their community. So what we can start seeing here is a very organic web of support that maybe reaches a little bit beyond the more um, uh, traditional method of a single observation and feedback. Um, and then the, the last question really for me was about supporting assessment networks and you know how do we how do we effectively crowdsource uh, judgment sometimes and, and I think they have the ways that we can do that I'm very mindful of the the met project that um, um, we were sort of tangentially in, involved with over in the United States and, and and the extent to which they highlighted the challenges of a, of a one-off summative uh, observation and I know a lot of providers have, have really worked very hard to move away from that kind of model but it is worth re reviewing the extent to which uh, that that model uh, uh, is flawed and then contrasting it potentially with the way that we can use digital platforms to take 
uh, video um, and share that within um, a community of assessment that allows us to uh, take multiple perspectives, build up a shared language, average out the results and provide some transparency to the people who are um, being assessed. So just to be explicit, you can use the forms tools on Iris Connect to analyze uh, videos that have been shared with you. Those uh, videos can be shared, can be analyzed by say three um, observers uh, to, to generate inter-rater reliability. One level, uh, of course, is that we're learning from each other um, how we're um, assessing, but also this system will physically force uh, a mean uh, result from that as well. So there's, uh, so there's definitely potential to explore there. And this is just a, a, a kind of a final like snapshot zoom out representation of the way that we can use video uh, strategically across uh, an ITE uh, process. So you've got the ability for student teachers to record, reflect on their practice, but also to share that potentially with other student teachers for peer feedback. You've then got relationships with the in-school mentor where the videos can be shared with them and that can form the basis of an effective professional conversation. We can also connect the mentors together in order to enable them to provide better support and learn from one another. Coming up a level within that, of course, there's the relationship between the provider and the in-school mentor, which can be greatly augmented by video. One of the things I haven't um, really dug into here is the fact that the actual conversations themselves through our video conferencing facility or the in-person stuff can be recorded directly back into the Iris Connect platform. So we can start reflecting on the professional conversations that we're having, the real glue that's pulling this system together. And then of course, the other part of it is that the university can curate the materials and resources that are coming back from the field and develop practice libraries, film clubs, uh, spaces for all trainees to access examples of not necessarily best practice, but real practice and use that as a point of discussion and development. So, um, and of course, the final component of that, which I think Karina uh, related to as well, was the fact that we can then use uh, the video as a source of um, research and that that allows us to really close the loop between the theory and the practice and we'll start seeing a direct relationship between uh, real life, real time practice and, uh, and, and the research and recommendations that we're providing to, to teachers. So um, yeah, that's a, a really quick uh, whistle-stop tour of, of how we hope to be able to pull all of the threads uh, of, of this together within a more holistic way. So it's not just a matter of us trying to overcome a short-term challenge, although I hope we can be useful in that regard, but actually to move forward beyond the maelstrom into uh, something that perhaps carries, carries more intrinsic benefit for, for all participants. So um, with that, um, I think what I'll do is, uh, how are we doing for time? We've got uh, not a huge amount left before we reach the top of the hour. Um, would it be beneficial for us to have a round of sort of final thoughts from, from the panel and, 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 and participants at this stage? Has anyone got any major things that they would like to, to share in terms of reflections from the session that they they, they maybe learned as a result uh, or something they had they weren't aware of from before? I've got a, a comment. I think maybe for a follow-up webinar, it would be rather good to see what I would have to do as an ITE tutor and what my relationship with a student might be. And you might want to might need to mock that up. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be most helpful in seeing what the switch in practice is that's required mm -hmm. on both sides. Well, one of the things that we might be able to do is just do a screen capture recording of what it would be like to be on platform and receiving videos being shared to you by uh, the various different stakeholders, either from mentors or for, for the individual teachers themselves. So we're more than happy to make something like that uh, available. I also just, um, as a matter of uh, interest, if you want to just dig in a little bit more, because it's not, not much sense in, in, in doing a full demonstration of Iris Connect on here. But um, if you if you click on discover.irisconnect in the, in the chat, that will take you to a page that gives you a video overview of kind of how these things work. Excellent. So I might uh, hand over at this uh, 
section to uh, to Graham in order just to uh, round off, share some 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 final thoughts, um, and to, to bring proceedings to a close. Come on, Hello. there you are. I'm just checking. Andy, can you put? Uh, Katie's been busily trying to put together a summary page. Okay. Yes, I will screen share and see what we can see what we can dig up. So Katie has been trying to pull together some of the comments that are made, the opportunities, the challenges, and we've probably not got this all right. I mean, there's a lot more comments that were coming through on the chat and on the questions. What we will do is we'll update those. And of course, we'll circulate that at the end. So the challenges. I think we had some very good explanations of what ITE was going to see as challenges. Access, difficulty finding placement support for students, students less able to collaborate. And I think that is important. And that echoes back to the work that Karina was mentioning about collaborative work between students. Training of delivery online. What worries me is that having just had a quick look, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that the new ITT framework from Ofsted doesn't include ITC or training in online delivery, which is utterly bizarre to me at the moment. And that's a very high level question that needs to be sort of addressed. Uh, more research on what has and has not been effective, synchronous versus asynchronous, consequent financial issues, and that last one, yes, attitude of Ofsted to innovation. Needs, yes, we need more clarity from Ofsted on their position. We have written to uh, Ofsted. Uh, we didn't get a reply that will be followed up. Uh, more research on what makes effective online delivery. And I think there's a big challenge there for ITT providers to actually understand what is effective delivery. There's a whole wealth of research there and development of appropriate pedagogical resources, uh, approaches. The opportunities though, there are effective and cost efficient alternative to traditional practices. Beyond the maelstrom, there are, a, there are real potentials. Higher levels of collaboration between students using technology. I think we've started to see that. Improved collaboration between school-based mentors and ITT providers. There has been a gap in there in some cases. The use of a collaborative platform actually helps to bridge that. Contextualized feedback from observations. <clears throat> in the chat, somebody noted that uh, students were actually welcoming being videoed. And that reflects uh, the experience we've had in Finland where that has been actually a real positive. They said the contextualized feedback through the use of videos was actually far more meaningful for them. And the evidence-based submissions to student portfolios, uh, whether at the moment I, uh, Ofsted will accept those, but certainly I think they could be formative. And the opportunities for collaborative research. I don't think we've mentioned very much how often you, Iris Connect is used in research internationally. So I'd like to thank everybody for their contributions today. What I'd like to emphasize is that, yes, we did this in a hurry. This has been a quick fix to meet a problem. Maybe we've been a bit rough at the edges, but be gentle with us. Um, hopefully, this is a start of a professional dialogue, and we'd be very happy to run these events in the future. Katie put out a number of times, remember you can share relevant research and articles, and we will put that in this document that comes out to you so that we've got an opportunity to share the research, the articles, the resources that we have developed. Can I just ask if there's any other questions at all before we sign off? And I just thank everybody. Let's have a little look in the chat. Any, any, additional, any additional points? No, I think we're there. Okay. And can I just say a particular thank you to Marilyn, who actually came in and with questions a few times. Um, it was Marilyn that sort of pushed us towards running this webinar and gave enormous support and help in actually setting it up together and drawing people together. 
Sure. Uh, may, may I also just say something as well? I, I, one of the things that I really wanted this to run as a meeting so that we could have everybody physically involved and, and visible. Yeah. Unfortunately, with the numbers, we had to schedule it as a webinar and there are restrictions on the level of contribution you can make as a webinar attendee. So um, many, I hope actually a future event, what we could do is have less people, smaller numbers and a much deeper conversation um, with involving everybody. So if you have been sort of on the, on the, on the, uh, rough end of a, a, a stream of information and finding it hard to communicate back with us my deepest apologies and we'll, we'll seek to, to, to have a more um, discursive uh, experience uh, later on yep and can I thank the Irish Connect staff as well some of them have been working very very hard over the last few days unreasonable demands from me so thank you everybody thank you for attending and thank you for all your help bye thank you everyone